1980, Larry Bird led the Boston Celtics to 61 wins as a rookie, an incredible 32-win improvement over the previous season. The 79 Celtics were outscored by nearly 5 points per game, whereas Bird's Celtics outscored teams by 7 points a night, a whopping 12-point turnaround. But was Bird worth 32 wins by himself? Was he primarily responsible for that 12-point swing? The idea of a singular overall player rating has often been described as the holy grail of analytics, but is an accurate one-number summary of a player a pipe dream? What could we do to come up with a basketball holy grail that rates players accurately? The quest for the grail is not archaeology. It's a race against evil. One approach is to radically expand the box score and measure all kinds of actions to figure out what helps a team and what hurts. Points, deflections, screens, and so on. We could then tally up each player's context-specific actions and figure out who does the most overall good on the basketball court. The challenge with this approach is that we're limited by what we measure. If we only track points, rebounds, and assists, our player ratings won't be very smart. It's also tricky to assign the right value to each action. We'll talk about this more in part seven. Another option is to look at how a team performs when a player is on or off the court. This approach doesn't care if Bird averaged 40 a game or didn't even score a point in the season. The only thing that matters is how much his presence moved the needle for his team. This is nice because we don't have to worry about being biased towards scoring or defending. We only care about the bottom line change in the scoreboard. For instance, when Michael Jordan left for baseball in 1994, the Bulls point differential dropped by three points. Now, the temptation is to say Bird was worth 12 points per game and Jordan was worth three, but we haven't accounted for what else changed yet. To actually figure out how much Bird or Jordan impacted the scoreboard, we need to consider the quality of their teammates too. The 94 Bulls lost Jordan to the minors, but they also added Tony Kukoc, Steve Kerr, Pete Myers, and Bill Wennington. The 79 Celtics started lineups with Bob McAdoo, Jojo White, Billy Knight, Curtis Rowe, and Marvin Barnes, all players who weren't even on the 1980 team. In order to isolate Jordan's impact or Bird's impact, we'd have to figure out how those other changes also impacted the club. Were Kukoc and company worth two points a game for the 94 Bulls? Five points a game? We're, we're left with an equation that looks something like this. Most of us plug in some rough value for Jordan, he was worth 20 wins or something, and stop our mental estimation right there because this starts to get real tricky real fast. I mean, all the other Bulls aren't exactly the same in 94 as they were in 93. Some improve with age, others decline as they near retirement, and we would need to account for those factors too. Furthermore, Scottie Pippen and Horace Grant missed 24 games in 1994, so to compare apples to apples, we'd really want to look at 94 Chicago with Grant and Pippen in the lineup against 93 Chicago with Jordan and Grant and Pippen in the lineup. If we could keep all those other factors constant, like aging, the bench, and so on, then we could finally isolate Michael Jordan's impact on this team. In this case, Jordan added six wins to the Bulls' full season pace when everyone was healthy, but does this mean Jordan is worth six wins compared to the average player? Even if we hand wave all those other important factors away, we still have to be careful here, and this is key we're swapping out Jordan for one player only, Pete Myers. So Jordan's value in this case depends on how good Myers is. Look at it this way. If Chicago replaced Jordan with a 25-year-old Kobe Bryant, the Bulls drop off without MJ would be much smaller, but that wouldn't change how good Michael Jordan was relative to the average player. So in order to get that holy grail number, we'd have to know how good Myers is too. And here's where it gets really fun. In order to figure out just how good Myers is, we have to go through the exact same steps we just went through for Jordan, looking at how his team changed in 1994 when he left for the Bulls, and then we'd have to figure out how good Myers' replacement was too. And to figure that out, you'd have to look at his replacement's team, and well, you see where this is headed. We're gonna have to do this for just about every player. 
and that's going to require some serious math to keep track of all these players and point differentials. I don't know about you, but my head already hurts. So is there a better way? Where can we go from here? Back in 1997, the NBA started publishing play-by-play -play data. In other words, we could calculate the old hockey concept of plus-minus. Now, single game plus-minus should almost never be cited when discussing performance, because scoring stretches are way too streaky, and a few made threes flip a player's plus-minus in one direction or the other, regardless of how he actually played. Really, never do this. In larger samples, we typically convert plus minus to per 100 ratings as described in part three of this series, which means that we could compare Jordan's 1997 Bulls with him on the court versus off the court in the same season. The Bulls outscored teams by 14 points per 100 when MJ played in 97 and were plus four when he sat on the bench. We call this difference between on-court net rating and off-court net rating on off, but this still won't tell us a player's overall impact. It actually raises some new questions. First, how good were Jordan's teammates when he was on the court? Because of the way substitutions work, he might always play with Chicago's other starters, or he might carry bench units, we don't know. And second, how good was the other team when Jordan played? Maybe Mike feasted on opposing bench players or always played against opposing starters. Either way, these are factors we need to properly account for when evaluating on-off data. Sure enough, trying to account for those factors led to a stat called adjusted plus minus, often abbreviated as RAPM now. I'll skip the grisly mathematics and leave links in the description below, but in essence, we are solving the same giant equation we looked at earlier for Jordan and Pete Myers and the other Bulls and so on when we adjust a player's on-off. With raw on-off data, we don't know who else played alongside a player. Surely Jordan and bench players are a different team than Jordan with Pippen and Rodman. Rodman actually led the 97 Bulls in on-court plus minus, posting a monstrous plus 15.7 value when he played. But adjusting that figure brings Rodman well below Jordan. In other words, it was more likely Dennis's raw number was aided by a combination of playing against weaker opponents and or playing with stronger teammates himself, with one of those teammates being Michael Jordan. Meaning adjusted plus minus accounts for Rodman playing most of his minutes with Jordan and Jordan playing a bunch of minutes without Rodman. So adjusted plus minus is much smarter than raw plus minus, but this mathematical adjustment doesn't solve all of our problems perfectly. And so we still can't say with great precision how many net points a player is worth yet. just how accurate is adjusted plus minus anyway. Well, if we look at public APM values historically, almost every single player falls within minus five points per 100 and plus eight points per 100, with an NBA middle class settling between about minus two and plus two points per 100. We can test how dependent APM values are on team circumstances by looking at what happens when players change teams from year to year. In those situations, the average APM change is just under a point, about 30% greater than when players don't change teams, which means team circumstance does affect a player's adjusted plus minus. Multi-year studies that use play-by-play -play from two seasons will reduce about 15% of this noise, but remember, using multiple seasons reintroduces those aforementioned aging problems. Also, think about what these numbers mean for the league's middle class. 20% of players change by more than two points when they switch teams. A two-point change can be the difference between, say, the 75th best player in the league and the 200th best player. High impact players have slightly larger changes from year to year, but a two point change for an elite player might be the difference between the seventh and 25th best player in the world. Now, 
Part of the reason for this imprecision is that we can't really account for a player's specific role on his team. So you'll see some role players have great results when they find valuable synergies, then poor results on a team where their presence doesn't matter much at all. And this is a big deal because we only get to view players in a very small percentage of all possible lineup combinations. It's not like everyone gets to play with LeBron James and Anthony Davis or plug in next to Steph Curry and Draymond Green. So, despite giving us a decent estimate of player impact, adjusted plus minuses can't give us pinpoint precision unless we swap players around the league like a video game and play hundreds of games a year. I've petitioned the league to do this, and we're in a wait-and-see situation. Still, adjusting raw numbers makes a difference, and we can use this exact same process to learn more about specific kinds of impact as well. In part three, rebounding rate gave us a measure of how often someone grabbed misses, but we could use this same approach to see how a player impacts the entire team's rebounding. Take Steven Adams and Andre Drummond. Drummond finished third in defensive rebounding rate in 2019, grabbing a whopping 35% of available boards. Meanwhile, Adams wasn't in the top 200, but how do we know if Drummond was grabbing easy rebounds that his team otherwise would have roped in? What if Adams was boxing out like an offensive lineman so one of his teammates could easily grab the board? Again, we could approach this by looking at on-off rebounding differential. In Drummond's case, the Pistons actually grabbed more defensive rebounds with him on the bench, but Adams has the opposite pattern. OKC corralled 82% of defensive rebounds with him in the game, but just 75% without him. Since rebounding is a complex dance that is influenced by earlier actions in the possession, we again want to account for who was on the court, so an adjusted rebounding rate is even better. It's the exact same process as earlier, only we adjust for teammate and opponent rebounding strength to help contextualize an individual's on-off rebounding differentials. These kinds of adjustments for specific box score stats are currently on Ryan Davis's wonderful site, NBA Shot Charts, and sure enough, Drummond has finished outside the top 200 in this stat in the last three years, while Adams has finished in the top 30 twice in adjusted rebounding differential. Note the blip in 2018, symptomatic of some of the wonky noise that can be generated with only a single year of data to look at. We can also apply this same method for a clear picture of impact on teammate three-point shooting, impact on opponent's turnovers, and on and on. One more note on plus-minus data for lineups. Five-man lineups rarely play a lot together. Only nine lineups played over 500 minutes last season, and remember, those units aren't even adjusted for opponent quality. In a small sample, all it takes is some streaky shooting to make a lineup look worse or better than it really is, so be very cautious of putting stock into lineup results like that. And yes, a few hundred minutes is small here, six or seven games is not nearly enough time for a team's play to stabilize. One workaround is to use four-man or even three-man combinations to increase court time, but even then, opponent quality can add some uncertainty to the numbers. In summary, there's a lot to sort out when trying to isolate a player's impact on the scoreboard, and year-to-year -year changes create a lot of uncertainty. On-off measurements provide a better framework for us to estimate a player's overall impact or factor-specific impact, so we can capture value that isn't represented in the box score, such as rebounding impact on the entire team. But there are still factors we need to control for, like opponent and teammate quality, and adjusted plus minus does that fairly well. It's generally better at pegging high impact stars than sorting out middle class role players, although repeated results with varying teammates in different systems mean those values are less likely to be noise. So while this stat prevents us from context-free conclusions like Larry Bird was worth 32 wins and Michael Jordan only two, it still doesn't quite get us to a holy grail measurement of player impact. 
In part six of this series, we'll look at other one number metrics that try to capture player value. Adjusted plus minus studies have been super helpful in general research, like the value of high level defenders compared to the value of volume scores or low efficiency shooters and things like this. There is a bunch of additional reading in the description box below for those who wanna go really deep. Thanks to all the wonderful Patreon subscribers who make videos like these possible. If you wanna support this channel and get proprietary stats and additional analysis, head on over to Patreon patreon.com slash thinking basketball hope you enjoyed this one and as always that you are having a great day